Hi friends, it's Deanna Willison with Our Blooming Catholic Life, and I'm coming to you today with a new, to me book at least, The Five Wounds of St. Francis by Solanus M. Benfati, CFR, so Franciscan Friars of the Renewal. Some people say that's, you know, Father Stan's order. Some of us might call them jazz friars. Um, if you know, I've talked about the music of Brother Isaiah before. That is this order. Does it have anything to do with jazz? No, no. I don't. Not that I found. So let's just do a, a walk through the book quick and see what it's about. So secular Franciscans are supposed to read one bio, biographical work on St. Francis of Year. And while I did do that class on St. Clair and study her ranks, I haven't done one yet on St. Francis this year. Gosh, well, golly, we're already in June. So I was walking through the bookshop. Um, my husband was actually picking up his Magnificate, and um, he said those magic words, is there anything you need? And I was like, oh, because I was trying to be responsible and not buy another book, because you know. Um, but... I said, I don't have a new biography for this year. Do you mind if I just see if there's something biographical on St. Francis? And so this is what I found. I was attracted to it partly because I have not read any books written by Franciscan Friars in the Renewal. So that kind of attracted me right there. I was like, that's, that's very interesting because I have not read anything written by them. Um, it's normally the ones whose writings I pick up or, you know, the Friars Conventional or it seems to be Capuchins. Um, that write a lot, and I think I think our formation manual is written by a friar minor, so we get a good mix there. But hmm, this is a fellow third order brother, right? A CFR. So let's see. Um, front just says Five Wounds of St. Francis. Aha, here's a subtitle. You had to go inside and see. I didn't read this far when I picked it up, I was kind of in a hurry, and I didn't want my husband to change his mind about buying me a book. So I didn't get far enough to read the in, the uh, inside a, an historical and spiritual investigation. Even if I read that, like what on earth does that mean? And I have to admit, when I picked up the book to read then, I've been like cruising through it. I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> Sorry, friends. Um, but I've already started it because it is fascinating. It's not all what I thought it was going to be. I really thought it was going to be more biographical. And this is again by Solanus M. Banfati, I think, Franciscan Friars of the Renewal, with a foreword by Fernando Uribe OFM. So he's a Friar Meyer. It's, of course, by Tan Books in Charlotte, North Carolina. Yes, yes, copyright, all that. The cover art's interesting. It says it's used with permission of the Ministero per i Beni e le Avatitibita Culturali in Florence. Further reproduction by any means is forbidden. So, excuse me, but it was on the book cover. Cover design, this was then by Lauren Rupar, has an ISBN printed and bound in the United States. So very, very little there for most books. And it is dedicated to Father Conrad L. Harkins, OFM, my first teacher of Franciscanism. Again, very short. Um, and then we have a little opening which is first on in Latin and then in English, wanting to show how much love he had for him. The Lord placed in his members, in his side, the stigmata of his most beloved son. And that is from Anonymous. I think that's Anonymous. A Perugia is how we would end up saying it, but it's Anonymous Perusinus. Now here's where it got hairy. When I first opened this, so yeah, I took it, I thought it was a biography on St. Francis, so bought it, grabbed it. We took it when we were getting an oil change in my car. I'm like, oh, it's a late read. I'll read this while I'm waiting for the car. And then I started looking at the out table of contents. I was like, holy scrignoli, what did I get myself into? Um, forward, preface, list of abbreviations, chronology and life of... I don't have my microphone on, friends. Yikes. Be right back. Hi, friends. Sorry about that. Um, when I don't use a microphone, I know my voice is very high highs and very low lows and it breaks suddenly and it drives my family insane and the microphone helps condense that sound so it's not so crazy for you. So I apologize for the first segment of this video where I was not wearing the mic. Um, but yeah, so you can see, now it's super easy to read. Um, they've even used bold, they've used italics. They've really done a great job of organizing this to make it super easy to find. Um, so then after we have the it's funny because I would have called all that the general introduction. The next thing is general, general introduction. 
the reading, the early writings about Francis, and it has four points there. The Franciscan question, anchor points, one Chilano and two Chilano. The two waves of material and conclusion. Part two of that is the historical theological approach, subjective and objective dimensions of history, the subjective per perspective, which is Christian, historical theology in the stigmatization. Three is the stigmata debate. Four is the structure and plan of the book. Um, and then, then it's going to go into the earliest writings about the stigmata as part one. See if I can get rid of Just look, oh, part two, hypothesizing what really happened. Part three is guessing Francis's experience of the stigmatas. General conclusion, bibliography, and index. So what are we even talking about? What is the Franciscan question? I'm going to jump to that really quick because at this point you're probably like, what on earth is is even this book about? So let's jump over and get that. Um, and then we'll come back to some other points. Yikes, I can't even find page one. So the Franciscan question. He does say, without pretending that this book is written for a popular audience, I still thought that the non-specialist might be interested in it. That is why I'll begin by trying to introduce in a broader way the basics of the early written materials about Francis of Assisi. His dossier, like his person, is indeed fascinating, which probably accounts for so many non-Franciscan historians devoting considerable attention to it. The so-called Franciscan question was and is a historiographical debate about the identification, chronology, and interrelationship and historical value of the early written materials about Francis. I will give a high, highly abbreviated version of its story. The seed ground of the debate was tilled in the 19th century as scholars began to profit from the first printed editions of numerous high, I can't, can never say his words, hagiographical sources for Francis's life, but the discussion really began in earnest at the turn of the 20th century and gained pop particular momentum when the French historian Paul Sabatier discovered a manuscript crop copy of the Speculum Perfectionis, Mirror of Perfection. That manuscript styled its contents as the earliest biography of Francis, and since we know now elements of that work in fact flow from a letter, early 14th century, and polemical perspective on Francis, his thesis sparked vivacious debates and contributed to the mushrooming of text and literally critical studies. What it is basically is, is are any of these sources true? What came from another source? Was one like a raw source and then one was edited? Were they compilations of sources? What was going on in the writings about St. Francis? Because he has always been a popular topic. And I'm going to say right here, there have been a number of little um, notes and they are not footnotes. He felt that that would be too distracting, but they are at the end of every chapter. It's just like, bam! footnotes at the end of the chapter. So they're not truly end notes, not truly footnotes. They're the end of the chapter notes, but it's just, it's overwhelming. It's block text. Um, if you're going to want to refer back to them, if you're doing this as a true historical study, I say find out where they are in every chapter, mark them. So when you get to the, when you get to a footnote, you know where to flip to find that note. Um, so let's go back. So we are arguing about the five wounds of St. Francis, were they actually the wounds of Christ? Were they some form of leprosy or skin disease? Or were they like metaphorical? And so we're going to look at that from many different angles and ways. I keep holding that book up. I don't want to get sued. Um, let's hope I don't own that. Probably shouldn't keep saying that. X. Um... So, what do we have next? It's a, it is pretty handy for anyone here. Um, the, even if you just read the preface and the introduction, it's very interesting. So, the list of abbreviations, I think he uses the standard ones that we're using all along. If you followed me or took that class with me by uh, Father Bill Hugo, you would know these. Um, most of these are included in our early sources, our Chunky Monkey three volumes set with the index. So like first Chilano, first letter to the faithful, second Chilano, second letter to the faithful, third Chilano, fourth Chilano. Um, I think these are standard. I did not look them up. 
but either way they're here again if you're not familiar with those you're probably going to want to put a little post-it there or something that you're going to remember that and in fact he does refer to francis of assisi the early document straight up now why does he list that separately because these are all different translations sometimes of the same documents that's why they're listed separately because that's part of what we're discussing is the authenticity of the different um, sources other abbreviations tons of them he uses this is a very academic book i'm not going to lie not gonna lie it is pretty academic but it is very interesting i think the non-academic is still going to get something out of it you're going to get the same thing now but you're still going to get plenty of value out of it the chronology of life and related events pretty straightforward there um this text this paper is super white this text is is pretty dark and so it's pretty easy to read everything um, except for the end notes, the spacing's all lovely. You have a little bit of room, a uh, little tiny bit of wiggle room over here for notes, not a lot. Um, so you, if you are somebody who annotates the work as you go along, you are probably going to want to have post-it notes handy or a notebook to add your annotations in here. Um, you can see the headers are all clearly marked. And again, you saw before, it's completely in outline format. And he carries that throughout the book. At the top, it just has the more general. Remember, we had like three or four sections. So that's going to be here. Title of the book over here. Remind you what you're doing. I don't think you're going to forget. But any of the section headers are very, very well marked. See, incredibly well marked. So he has his outline points in bold. Very easy to read. Um, I'm a little bit into this. I will say it's completely fascinating. I've managed to get all the way to the letter of Elias. Um, and here's something what he does. This is different so he compares three different translations of documents um, and is saying that these all look similar talking about great joy and so he's marking it for you it says then too in Elias and Julian the verb used for the way blood exited the side of the wound is evapore whereas for Thomas it is emitere <laughs> like we're really going there um, so you don't necessarily have to run and get all your sources he does occasionally put them right there for you to compare, which is pretty nice. Um, I'm not further than that. I'll say it, yeah, as a book, it's incredibly readable. Now, he does use the standard academic way of doing block quotes, which can be a little bit difficult to read. Honestly, if I didn't have my reading glasses on here right now, I'll switch to my regular bifocal glasses. <laughs> Take the reader ones off. The readers are monofocal. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I can still read these with my regular bifocals. Um, yeah, and totally looking out of the very, very bottom, but I can read it. Honestly, I can read it without my glasses. That block quote's a little bit of a struggle, but I can still do it. Um, so yeah, it's set up very well. I haven't gotten any further. Let's just flip to the back. Conclusions of bibliography. Um, we were promised a bibliography at the end. And it is sectioned off as well. Um, totally readable. Again, he's using mostly academic formats here. So let's see if he has a separate section within there. Yep, because then there's a section on modern works. So they're actually sorted as to more ancient sources and modern sources. That's pretty darn handy there. I have to say I like that. I've not seen that before. An index. Ah! Yes, he has an index. It is alphabetical. Um, even gives you a little gap between them. Totally legible lovely lovely and what is after that just a little bit of information about 10 books in the back and that's it lovely i did buy this at the shrine of saint anthony gift shop in ellicott city maryland but of course you could always go to tanbooks.com that's t-a-n like the thing you get in the summer when your skin turns darker tanner um there's not a lot of reviews in the back i think the review is just the one from Fernando Uribe, I think OFM, Chair of the Biographical Sources of Francis and Claire at the Pontifical University Antonianum. Hmm. Seems like a little hardcore Franciscan scholar there. He says, we are before a highly mature work. It is both conducted with great responsibility and seriousness and circumspect in its judgments and conclusions. For the still current question of the stigmata of Francis, it makes a valuable contribution that cannot be ignored and you know today is the 100th birthday that i'm filming this of servant of god john bradburn you had to know i was going to work him in um 
Did he have the stigmata? No, he did not have the stigmata, um, even though he actually did work with lepers. So that's one of the theories going at, right by scholars. Um, it, John Bradbury did not catch leprosy. He did not have the stigmata. But after he died, there were a number of mysterious things that happened around his death. And one of them is that his friend Ann Lander was very moved to put three white lilies on his coffin at his funeral. And they were, of course, for the Trinity. If you read any of John Bradburn's poems at johnbradburnpoems.com, just make sure you have an E at the end of Bradburn. Um, you're going to see that, in fact, most of his poetry, and he's the most prolific poet in the English language, most of his printed poetry is either about the Trinity or about Mary. Um, so she was moved to take three white lilies for the three and one for the Trinity and place them on his coffin at his funeral mass. And in fact, when she did that, three drops of blood came out of the bottom of the coffin. Many, many people saw this. They were freaked out. They were horrified. Um, you know, the body was whisked back almost right away. The, the undertaker thought he was going to lose his job. Um, people were flipping out. And when they opened it, they noticed two things. One, that John was not buried in his Franciscan habit, which was one of his three wishes he wanted as his death. And it is the right to this day of every secular Franciscan to be buried in the secular Francis, well, in the Franciscan habit. Um, and so they knew that to go and change that. But of course, they were gonna have to pick up the body and they were investigating to see where the processing of the body went wrong. And in fact, the body had no sign of blood on it. There was no signs of blood inside the coffin. There is no explanation for the three drops of blood that came out, except that they were for the Trinity. Um, and so that is one of the, the blessings there of Blessed John Bradburn. And even the book, I imagine, is going to get into it, whether or not you need to physically bear the wounds. We've heard of other stigmatists who say they physically bear the pain. And I would say that, what, I won't say that John physically or emotionally bore the pain of the stigmata, like literally in his hands and in his feet he bore the wounds of christ i think in his heart as his heart broke for his brothers and sisters at matema and he did everything he could to ease their pain um there are some beautiful videos out there for john's 100th birthday one of them is a happy birthday john video and in it many of the people who knew him actually talk about him one of his i think I think it's a nephew not a great nephew i think it's a nephew discusses how they actually would hollow out books which is funny because you know john's love, love of books and how much he needed paper to write poetry on but they would literally hollow out books to put medicine inside to send medicine for the lepers so that they would be able to get medicine if they had not hollowed out the book and hidden the medicine inside it probably would not have gotten to the leprosy clinic that is how far john's passion and love for these people were and that is one of the unique things I really think about Servant of God and John Bradburn is people are moving his cause forward, not, not necessarily just to get him honor or just to get him recognized or to make him more well known. It's to make, it's to be able to continue his work at Matemla. And one of the beauties that we get from that work, from participating in that work, is that we really see that, that we are all the outcasts, so many of us. I know growing up, you feel alone at times. You feel that nobody understands you. Um, and I, I, I feel like John probably felt that way many times in his life, that he was misunderstood. And that's one of the reasons why he tried out, would try out monastery after monastery. And, and he knew he had a calling from God and he was really trying to discern it. But I think people misunderstood him a lot. Um, and I know there's tons of us out there that feel that way, that people just don't understand us and what we're trying to do. And if they could see our hearts, they would understand, just like Jesus holds out his, literally holds out his sacred heart. And he holds it out to show us that it's on fire with love for us. And still we can't quite understand that, even though he's literally showing us his wounded and broken heart that is literally on fire for us. Um, and so John tried to do that, I think, through his poetry. He said that his poetry was really written by Mary. And so I think that's the love of God and the broken heart of Mary, the broken heart of Jesus coming through his poetry, trying to reach mankind in another way, not in, in an apparition of Mary, not in Jesus speak coming down off the, you know, speaking from the San Damiano cross. People have had visions and encounters with Christ in many ways, but for whatever reason, they thought, modern man, let's try this poetry angle. And so they speak with 
with a misfit, the voice of a misfit, the voice of an outcast who has a, quite the quirky sense of humor. Like I've said, the poetry is quite mystical, but has quite a sense of humor. And that does remind me of St. Francis, who was always wanting to go off alone, and yet he was called to go to the people and share. And he was very charismatic and drew a following, and yet he would love to go to a cave and contemplate God. Very much, very much um, that John Bradburn was very similar in those ways. And, and when Francis got the stigmata, you know, friends, he didn't go out and show it. He didn't go out on a tour. I'm like the prior Stephen King said this weekend. He didn't, he didn't like charge people five dollars and I'll show you the wounds of Christ. Like he didn't go out and do that. What did it mean? And so that is going to be covered in this book. So I'm kind of excited to get to the point where that's covered and just to study that more, what it meant to Francis, what that experience was like to him. Um, and that's what I'm very excited about for this book. So I hope you read this book. I hope you watch the videos. Happy birthday, Servant of God, John Bradburn, follower of St. Francis in the Third Order of St. Francis, the Secular Franciscan Order. And God bless you, friends. We are all on a journey. There's all times that we are misunderstood, but we can take all our worries and cares to our mother who will comfort us as a mother and we can take them to our brother Jesus who is literally wounded and on fire with love for us and he will together they will help us right Mary can help lead us sometimes a little bit more softly up to Jesus who can take us by the hand and lead us up to the father to be reconciled God bless you friends on your journey